Hello there and welcome to the second video in a tutorial series on how to make an endless runner game in Unity 6 for mobile devices. This tutorial we'll be covering c -sharp coding, methods and variables. Remember to subscribe and click notification bell to stay up to date with every tutorial I upload. Feel free to leave a comment and drop a like. So creating code in Unity is genuinely a lot easier than what you think as long as you take it slow and know what your end goal is per script. And when creating a script, it's always good practice to keep everything neat and tidy. So let's go ahead and create our first script. What we'll want to do is go to Assets down here, right click, Create Folder, and we'll call this Scripts. And inside this particular folder, let's right click again, click on Create, and click on Mono Behavior Script. It may be called C Sharp script, depending on what version of Unity you are using, but it's the same thing. So this particular script is going to be something that controls our player because we'll build it to do something in this tutorial, but then we'll continue to build onto that script as we go further in the series. So we'll call it player move. And let's then after it's named and let's keep an eye on its name. So capital P and a capital M with no space. Let's now press return or enter and let's open that up in Visual Studio. So Visual Studio is the application that we'll be doing all of our programming in, but you're not restricted to Visual Studio. As long as the code is written in the same way, you could effectively write your code in any application. Generally, I think you'll find that, um, at least for a beginner, Visual Studio is probably the best way to go. So as it loads the actual application up, it will present to you a default layout of your script. And there are a couple of things that we have to talk about when we get the default view, because knowing these things before we start coding is kind of important to how we actually code a little later on. It is just loading now, it's taking a little bit of time. I think sometimes Visual Studio can be a bit slow when you first open it. Sometimes it might be a good idea to have it open, ready and waiting for you. Uh, but if you're at this point and it hasn't opened like it has for me, you may need to go back into Unity and just double click on the script and it should open it. There we go. Okay, so we have this now. So you'll notice that there are a bunch of lines already in here. Why is it written some script for us already? Well, this is the default script layout for anything you would build in Unity. So whenever you create a brand new script, it will look like this. And there are things we need to talk about to understand why these are here. Let's start with line one, using Unity engine with a semicolon. What does that mean exactly? Well, up here is something known as the namespace. And the easiest way to think of what a namespace is, is a library. And the script needs to know a couple of things to do different things in its script. So it thinks, okay, I need to do this. Let me go to the library and have a look how to do it. And effectively, that's what it does with the namespace. It's a reference place for the script to understand. As we go further down, we have here public class, player move, mono behavior. And you'll notice that this public class here, player move, is the exact same name as what we call our script. It is crucial that the name of the script and the class name are identical. If you change the script name at any point, you do have to change the class name, otherwise the script will not work. Capitalization is also crucial when it comes to coding because if we change this to a lowercase p, it wouldn't work. Although it still says the same thing, play a move, it wouldn't work. Capitalization is important. As we go further down, into the class, you'll notice we have an open curly bracket. That means that is the start of the class. And what is a class exactly? Well, it's a place where we can store things like methods and coroutines and variables. It's essentially the core of a script. It contains everything that the script can run. Going down further, we have a green line here with some double slash in front of it. And it says, start is called once before the first execution of update after the mono behavior is created. That sounds like a load of words that mean nothing, but what it actually says is that this right here, void start, will run once when the script starts. So if we play our game, whatever is inside void start will run just once. But what is void start? 
This is known as a method. And a method is where you put all of your executionable lines of code. So for example, if we start our game and we want a fade screen to happen and we want some music to suddenly start playing, you would put that in void start because you want those lines of code to be executed when the game starts. So that is the method. So anything that is void start or void update, those are methods. And void update is called once per frame. So if you want something to happen constantly in your game, you would use update. If you want something to happen just once in your game, you would use void start. And this brings me on to the idea of what we want to create in this script. We want to create the idea of a player constantly moving. So we would use the update method. You're not restricted to just these two methods. You can create your own methods and use different methods. So don't be afraid to ever try and explore. So right now we don't need void start. We don't need these, which are known as annotations. We understand what they're for and what they do. All we need right now is the update method. So let's delete these lines of code. So we're left with just the class and void update. Now, one thing that we do have to also be aware of is things like variables. And a variable can be pretty much anything in a script. It could be a number, it could be text, it could be an audio source, it could be a game object. And it helps the script identify what it's doing with different things. So for example, we're going to have a variable to control how fast our player will run. And what we can do is if we start here, press the tab button so we are in line here, and let's declare a variable. Now I am going to start by declaring this as, uh, I'm going to serialize the field, and I'll explain what kind of declaring variables means and the different ways you can declare them once we've written this line of code. So first thing what we want to do is in square brackets, we need to type serialize field space. And you'll notice it turns green. And you may have also noticed it kind of predicted what we were going to put. I'll get onto that a little later on. The next thing we want to do is we need to tell the script what type of variable this is going to be. It's obviously going to be a number, but is it going to be a decimal number or is it going to be a whole number? If it was a whole number, we'd type INT, short for integer, which is a whole number. If it was a decimal, and we're going to use a decimal at some point, we need to type the word float. So a float is a decimal number. So if you're ever declaring a variable as a decimal number, it always has to be a float. And let's call this something. Let's call this move speed. And you'll notice that I started that with a lowercase m, but the second word of it is an uppercase s. This is known as camel casing, and it's generally widely considered to be the best way of using variables and declaring them. At the end of this line, let's now put a semicolon. Why do we put a semicolon? Well, that effectively tells it that that's going to be the end of the line. And we'll come back to this line and modify it a little later on in this tutorial. But whenever you end a line with a semicolon, the script will then move on to the next line below it. In this case, it would be void update. This here, unity message, zero references. This isn't a line of code. You can see here that line five is our variable and line six is the start of the method. So what do we put inside our method to make sure that we have our player cube moving? Well, it's one simple line of code, but it may seem confusing at first. So the next thing you need to do is click the line between the open curly bracket and close curly bracket. And we need to change something in the inspector panel. So if we click on our player, remember what we said earlier about how we can change these transform component options here. We can change the position of it, can't we? So if we look at the Z axis, for example, if we hold our mouse button over the Z, hold left mouse button, we can effectively move it back and forth. And it's gone a bit crazy there, so let's set it back to minus seven, but you can move it like that. And we want to do that. So we want to change this option right here, but how do we do that in code? If we go back to the script, we actually say we want to 
transform because that's the transform and we want to translate with a capital T. So we want to change, we want to do something. And the idea of changing something is always done like this, at least through movement, through transform.translate. And in brackets, we need to tell it how we want it to move. So in this case, we need to say we want it to move forwards. So we can actually say vector three dot forward. Now you may be thinking, what does that mean? What's vector three? Well, you can think of using vector three because we're in a 3D environment. Moving forward means that we are increasing this number. So backwards would mean we are decreasing that number. And like I say, it's once you stop and think about what some of these things mean, so we're changing the transform in a 3D environment and moving forward on the Z axis or Z axis. So heading back into the script, after we've done that, we then say multiply, which is a star, time dot delta time. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we are moving it in time with, well, basically real time. So we're telling this at this point, move it forward in real time, but now we have to multiply it by how fast we want to move it. And remember, we set that up here as the move speed. So we can say multiply by move speed. And you'll see it's kind of predicting once again what we're going to put. So when you see this in kind of grade italics, if you press tab, it will indeed fill it in for you. So you don't have to type it, but this is in uh, Visual Studio, like I say. So at this point, we've told it to move forward in time with the game at whatever we set move speed as. But there is one thing that we need to also include. So we need a comma, and then we need to put that all of this movement has to be relative to the world around it. So we say space dot world. And then we close the bracket and then semicolon. So let me quickly go over what this line of code means. I know I've said it multiple times, but let's be 100% clear. We are saying that whatever object this script gets attached to, in which case the player cube, then every frame it will transform itself. It will move forward at the same time as the game at whatever speed that we set it as relative to the world around it. So currently we don't have a move speed set, so it wouldn't move at all. So why don't we go back to our variable up here and after move speed, let's put equals and let's put two and save our script. So you can hold control, press S, or you can go file and save. And that script has now saved. So we're effectively moving this forward two. And I know it's an arbitrary number, it's, it, it seems irrelevant, but you'll see how this kind of plays out a little later on in this video. So right now we have a script written that will move any object it's attached to. Let's head back into Unity and give it a moment to compile if that window pops up. And now what we need to do is add this player move script to our player. And we can just drag and drop right there. And then if we click player and scroll down, you'll notice down here we have a new component, which is the script we've written. Yes, that's right. A script can also be a component. And you'll notice there we have move speed as two. That's because that is our variable and we can effectively change this if we want to. For now though, let's press the play button and let's see what happens to this object, to the cube. It should, all being well, move forward. And we should see it in the scene view and the game view. And there we go. We have literally started creating a game and that cube will forever go forward until we tell it to stop via scripting or turn it off. And Coming back to this move speed, if we set that move speed to five, you can see it moves quicker. If we set it to zero, it stops because it cannot move. So effectively, we can fully control how fast this player cube will move just through this variable, just by typing a number. We could put 10 and move faster, set as one, it moves slower. 
Now our cube's way off in the distance now, it's gone way past this bit here, so let's press stop. And what that will do is it will reset everything to how it was before you pressed play. So never be afraid to press play and then press stop because it won't change your game forever, it'll just reset how everything is. If you do make any changes whilst you're in the play mode, uh, it won't actually take effect. So like I say, if we press play, and let's say we set our move speed to, uh, let's set it to nine, I guess. So when we're in play mode and we are moving, let's set that to nine. So it's moving a lot faster, press stop. It resets back to how it was before you actually pressed play. So right now we've got the basics of coding down. We've got a cube moving, and I know it doesn't look too much like the uh, thumbnail that I've got for this, but trust me, we will get there pretty soon. Uh, next tutorial, what we'll do is we'll add in buttons to move the blocks side to side. So this will require a bit more in-depth coding, but like I say, coding is easy once you know what you're trying to do with it, assess it line by line, and you shouldn't have too many problems. So remember to subscribe and click notification bell to stay up to date with every tutorial in this series, and I'll see you next time.